Thank you very much. But I'm going to introduce... Oh, don't worry about it. It's okay. It's all, it's all good. Don't worry. Honestly, don't worry. Don't worry. Uh, I'm just here, the kind of the person waiting for the next speaker, really. Uh, so Keith Harry is our next speaker. And uh, he's very supportive of Giant. He came last year with his company, Icantis, and they are doing some amazing things uh, in wearable technology, monitoring patients, etc. So good that Vodafone and Deloitte were all over him last year and said, this is the future. And Gus Amir, who's the director of Deloitte in the UK, came up to say, Shafi, I found the future of healthcare. And it's Keith Erie. So Keith, thank you so much. <laughs> wow. from the edge there, Keith. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah. Well, how do I follow that? <laughs> Thanks, Shafi. Um, so Shafi's been telling us about the future. I kind of think I want to reset a little bit. Um, anybody else here running business? You present your business plan to the investors. The future is always fantastic. What about meeting payroll at the end of the month? Anyone know the feeling? So this is the reality. So the future, yeah, it's coming. And the future hospital, as we've heard, will be everywhere. So what's the reset? And what's this about the two worlds? Well, we're talking about big money. We're talking about digitalization. And if we just look at one aspect of that, healthcare information systems. Look at the money that's been spent on that. So 56.4 billion a year currently and going up per year. That's a huge amount of money. And yet, we all know this, things aren't really getting any better. So. We know the US is spending this kind of money. We've just heard that the UK is spending up to 10% of GDP. And not only that, but things are really getting worse. So the future is great, but the thing is, how are we going to get there? And what is it that we're not doing at the moment which makes that difficult? And yeah, we just heard about the Federated Data Platform with. Uh, somebody's friend's volunteer. <laughs> um, does anyone really believe in this room that that is going to make a difference to any patient care in this country in the next five years? Probably not. So what we do know is that there's hundreds of billions, hundreds of billions that have been spent on creating this digital world and people working in hospitals. So healthcare is not improving. It really isn't getting any better. And look, this is what's going on. Overcrowding, difficult, difficult sort of situations for patients. Not enough people who want to stay in the healthcare profession. What's going wrong? What is going wrong? And look, whatever anybody says, tragically, a lot of people are going to die this year of avoidable deaths in this country. So, yeah, we can talk about the future, but what are we going to do now and how are we going to get there? And this is something else. We talk about data, but this is from Beth Andrews, who's the healthcare head at Dell. 97% of that data never gets looked at, doesn't get used. So what the hell's it doing? If anyone wants to dispute this, please do. <laughs> but I'm, I, I think that's really shocking. Really shocking. So we are now looking at something, though, which will make it possible to start using this data. And we've just heard from Shafi, new forms of machine learning, new large language models that can start to make sense and use of this data, which is great. But let me talk here, just for a moment, a word of caution about that. Yesterday we were talking about sustainability. Has anyone any idea how much energy running those large language models take? Anyone, any idea? Lots, megawatts. 
these big data centers that have to be sort of built next to power stations, these are expensive in energy environmental terms. So they're competing with our brains. How much, how much power does our brain typically use in doing all the complex processing? Anyone any idea? A few watts, maybe 10, 12 watts. Just think about that for a moment. And this is really incredible. And then when we start thinking about all the big data systems, don't forget these are expensive. These are environmental disasters unless there are real major changes in technology. And there are some, but <coughs> I don't want to talk about that right now. <laughs> so let's talk about what are these two worlds. So this is a really old idea. It's right back. Plato spoke about this. Any philosophers in the room? Remember the Platonic world, the world of ideals? So we have a physical world. We have this projection of the ideal. And if you don't like Plato, look at it in cats. Right? <laughs> so you have the ideal perfect cat, and then you have your cats. <laughs> so these are the real cats, but they're all imperfect. And in healthcare, or in many cases, the physical world is the real world, this one, IRL, right? And this has become the virtual world or the digital world. And Shappy showed us some of those worlds. They look beautiful, fabulous, ideal. So. That's one world. This world is the digital world. When you go into a hospital these days, what do you see? You see everybody on a screen. So a lot of healthcare, nearly all of it, is taking place in this digital world, which is fine. Or is it? It's cost a lot of money. But this is where we live. And we're really messy people, messy being. For a start, there's a lot of us, right? And we're all kind of different. We're all over the place. And we never stop. We start, we keep growing, we get old. We change all the time. And that's why things get difficult. So this is one world. This is the world we live in. And then there is that ideal, the digital world. This is the big problem, particularly in healthcare. How do we connect this digital world and this physical world? This one is alive. This is dynamic. In healthcare, the healthcare data that's stored in those EMRs and everything else, it's static dead. So how do we do this? Well, there's really only three ways that's done in healthcare. So the first one, you connect patient to a bedside monitor and you lock them down into the bed, cables, wires, tubes sometimes. These are really expensive. They're not really practical for general use, even throughout a hospital. You can't take them home. And anybody who's worked with these knows that you have lots of things going wrong, alarms are going off, cables are being disconnected, dislodged. And you also need a fairly high degree of skill to use them. But you do get continuous data. So let's just take a brief journey to the side and look at why continuous data is important. Because remember, Shafi told us that the patient journey is something that isn't really being understood. 
everything in our body that you can measure changes continuously. This is on a daily basis. These are normal people. Body temperature changes, blood pressure changes, hormone levels change. So where are you going to measure that? And what does that mean? And these changes are large. Look at what happens in, with your body temperature. Very normal. Two degrees change per day. So you ask somebody what's normal body temperature, they say 37 degrees. Turns out that that's not right because that was agreed or sort of standardized a long time ago. And a lot of the patients where that data came from were febrile. So we're actually running a little bit lower than that. But two degrees shift, that is a lot. And the other thing that changes temperature is your age. So the older you are, the less variability, the less change you have. It also depends on where you measure it. So here's three different places where core temperature is measured where you get three different answers. And it depends on what you're doing. This is somebody exercising, working from rest up to VO2 max and recovering. Body temperature is changing. And this, this is really well known for half the population for a lot of their lives, a really big change in temperature. So that's great, but look again. From here to here, 0.6 of a degree. And remember, every day we're changing two degrees at least. So it's difficult to capture that. And particularly, absolutely needs to be continuously measured to get an accurate reading. So all that comes down to the fact that you do need to look at things continuously because if you just take spot measurements, here is a, the threshold, the zone you want to be in. But if you just take two readings, you find you're in the zone, that's great. But if you look more closely, continuously, you can see that you have wide fluctuations, changes there. Some of them could be really dangerous. So this is really important. No matter how accurately you make some of these measurements, you're not actually getting any useful information. So I think this is important. There's nothing very precise about human physiology up here in what we might call the physionome, but there is something very, very personal. And so what we need to know is this, how are we changing as individual? Because yeah, we can look at our genomes, but that's the blueprint of the house. Anyone live in a house of a hundred years old? Have a look at the original plans. Nothing like the house now, right? So things change, and this generally is what we're working on in healthcare. So let's go back to how we bridge the gap between the real world and the digital world. The second one is in hospitals, nurses go around and make observations. These are time consuming in nurse time, but the real problem here is you don't get enough data. If you're lucky, you have observations every four, six hours, and that puts about 40 data points maximum in a 24-hour period about you as a patient. That is too few in terms of data points to apply with any kind of confidence, any kind of machine learning models. You're missing most of it. And you don't see anything between the observations. 
And the third way you can get data is patient self-entered data. This is really interesting, but currently most of the devices are not used in healthcare for various reasons. Sometimes the data quality is questionable, but also really importantly, what you would call the provenance of the data is unknown. Yes, somebody says this is my data, but how can you prove that? Are you as a physician going to prescribe a drug on the basis of that? Probably not yet. But people are learning a lot about themselves through these kind of new wearables, continuous devices. And if they're not continuous, the problem's even worse. And we have these very few data points. So where does this leave us? Well, it comes back to what we as ISANSAs are doing. And because this is giant, because we pay to be here, I can do some advertisements at this point. But this is really, really important. What we do is connect patients to the digital fabric. Because if you don't do that, you cannot understand the patient journey. And the reason we don't understand the patient journey is because we cannot really measure it. We can only get the continuous data if the patient is lying in the bed. We can't get the data normally for healthcare use if a patient is walking around. But this is what we do at iSansus. We create something like a digital twin. And we were using this terminology in healthcare long before most other people. And this is really the missing link. The digital world, generally, that we recognize here is the electronic medical record. So we're connecting patients, if you like, directly into the electronic medical record. And we do that, <coughs> we do that with what we call the patient status engine or status engine for the Americans. So we have wearable sensors. We use more than one sensor because it's not really possible to get accurate enough information from just one point on the body we take that through a local device. The local device is the point at which the nurses, the patients themselves, interact with the system. It goes through to the back end, where it's able to be delivered to the care teams. And it's also associated with something here which is critically important, which is the command center. And this is another thing about digitizing patients. How do you digitize entry in and out of the ward? So if we're talking about this being something like a virtual ward, how do you do your virtual ward round? That's what we're talking about. If somebody, if a patient is not being looked at as if they're in a hospital through a ward round, then they're not really in a virtual ward. You need some way of being able to coordinate, contact the patients, talk to the patients, and so on. So this is what this system looks like. The interesting thing is that within this boundary, the red boundary, all of that is a single medical device. So we have been able to work with the regulators to say, right, we have a product now. It's connected. It's connected through radios. And those radios are like cables and they are part of the product. The point is, if anybody here knows about any radio or wireless engineering, a radio link will always fail or fail to carry data some of the time. So you have to compensate for that. Because what we've optimized in this system is data quality, data continuity, integrity over immediacy. So this system isn't designed for patients in an intensive care ward where you have to do something because something goes wrong very quickly. It's designed to capture the data and alert well before something goes wrong. And that's even more important once you start talking about patients outside the hospital where they're in the virtual wards. So this is a way of being able to put patients into an acute virtual ward outside the hospital. They are continuously monitored. And the other interesting thing about the technology platform is that regardless of where that patient is, it's the same 
devices, the same components, so the patient is able to move anywhere. We're working with our friends from a company called Content Guru, who make the contact center, the command center, that allows all this to be held together, gives a single view to the doctor when they are looking at a patient. So they have the incoming data coming in from here, the live data. They have the static data coming in from here. This system, our patient status engine, has a whole range of clinician set alerts, notifications that are then associated with a particular patient's condition, which then trigger a response in this system. A trigger will then bring up that patient's record, their EMR, any other data. And from here, the remote care team or physician is able to talk to the patient directly or make a video call. Even if that patient doesn't have any of the standard video apps, they can make the video call. And they can run a virtual ward round with this system. And this isn't the future. This is running on our stand at the moment, so come and see us. And by the way, I'm standing here and I'm being continuously monitored. So my colleagues on the stand right now they could switch in to my record running on the screen and they could look at my heart, they could look at my ECG and decide whether I should get off the stage and lie down for a little bit <laughs> or, or keep on going. I've nearly finished by the way. So, uh, so that's, that's what we have and this is important because remember what we're doing we're actually mapping the patient's journey. And we can't understand the patient's journey, Shafi, to your point, until we can measure it, until we know what is happening. And this, I think, is the first time that we've really started to think about what is it that we're trying to optimize in healthcare. We're trying to optimize the patient experience, but we haven't been able to measure that. Everything else has been secondary measures. How long was that person in hospital? What happened after they left? all of these kinds of things. This tells you and measures the response of the patient to the physiological, physiological response of the patient <coughs> to the healthcare system. And yes, despite the fact that people aren't looking at the data, it's all about the data. It's all about the data because you can start to apply the models. If you apply the models here in real time, you don't need to store every damn last piece of data. You only take what is important. And by doing that, you get these alerts, notifications, and you can take early action. And I really like this because for engineers in the room, what this is, this is a control loop with negative feedback. And th this is what doctors actually do all the time. So, that's us, our product, we think is something, a really new kind of medical device because it's distributed, it's connected, it maps the patient's journey. And yes, this is the way for the hospital without walls, the future. And if you worry, if you're thinking about where did they get that name from, it goes right back to the Latin and the San, health, wellness, and so on. Thank you very much. I don't know how I did on time there. Thank you. Thank you.